because around the Earth it makes daytime for us. What's <laughs> shining on the moon? I hear a lot of funny things at the eyepiece, but that's one of the funniest. <laughs> So the light can get through. Why are they hollow? Oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> well, the first reasonable telescope we built in about 1957, I think, is built from a 12-inch from a porthole. We had to take care of, a, of somebody who had jaundice. And I noticed that in his kitchen, he had this glass disc on his kitchen table. I thought it was six inches in diameter and about half an inch thick. So I called him up, how would you like to have that glass blank made into a telescope? Well, he would love it. So he brought it over. It was a 12-inch porthole, one inch thick. So what to grind it with, you see? We had to get another one to grind one against another one, you see? So our neighbor knew where the, where the marine salvage place is at the foot of Filbert Street. So we go down there and buy another one, and then we grind them together, and we made a 12-incher like that. When I looked through a 12-incher at the third quarter moon, I thought, my God, everybody's got to see this. And that's what happened to me. Watch it, it might happen to you. <laughs> anyway, just seeing the third quarter moon, I had no idea that it would look like that. I had no ghost of an idea that the moon would look like that through a telescope. But a 12 inch is like having, a, having an eyeball, you know, this big, with the pupil of your eye open 12 inches. Looking through our 24 incher, it's like having an eyeball 13 feet in diameter with the pupil of the eye open this wide. And you can see everything. Four professional astronomers have told me they never had a better show through anything than through our 24 incher. Four professional astronomers. One of them told me that below sea level in Death Valley. But we can see the stars in M1 through the, through the 24 incher. I just couldn't tell which one is twinkling. <laughs> it goes too fast. But we can see the stars. Okay, the next question uh, comes from the audience. As soon as I see a hand to point to. What's what? I use binocular eyepieces because they're retarded. <laughs> binocular eyepieces have an uncorrected field lens, you see. Anyway, you get more light through it, and they're lots cheaper. You see, one time in St. Louis, we went out looking for eyepieces, and in two hours, we came back with six broken binoculars and six extra eyepieces on a two-hour trip. What you do, you go into a junk store and you pick up one of his binoculars and you look through it and then you tell the boss, did you know that you have two gas stations across the street? <laughs> As soon as he sees that it's not a pair of binoculars, the price goes down to 25 or 15 bucks. My two best eyepieces, I paid $15 for the two of them. They're worth $60 a piece. What else? I don't know how big you can make it by yourself. Well, we made, we made several 24-inchers. Now, what was the other part? How much background do you have to... You just need to be walking around on two legs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't do it till I was 40 years old. But that's, not, that's my fault, not your fault. <laughs> We made a whole 10 inch telescope at the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference in seven hours. We did a whole 
10-inch telescope in seven hours. But that's more than one of us. Only one at a time can work on the mirror. So two of us took turns working on the mirror. And then while we're doing that, somebody else can cut the tube and make this, this secondary, the spider mount for the secondary, and make the tailgate, all those things. And when we're not working on the mirror, we work on those things. But we started at 10 in the morning, and we didn't have any water to go with our 60 grit carborundum. Some lady had a cup of tea. We used 60 grit carborundum and tea. Anyway, so. No, it just works like water. <laughs> it's, it's almost as wet as water. Tea is almost as wet as water. What? I'm allergic to the Big Bang. <laughs> Everybody knows that the Big Bang is a predominant theory that's running through the academic community, yes. I don't think I'm alone on that. Almost everybody knows this. Now, recently, because I'm allergic to the Big Bang, they asked, they asked me to engage in a debate with somebody in England. And we did it over a computer, and a little picture smaller than a piece of toilet paper. <laughs> and I'm supposed to talk to this picture. <laughs> and I, I had a hard time talking to the picture, and a very hard time listening to the picture. <laughs> but in the course of my remarks, I mentioned to the, to the person in England that uh, it looks to me as though the Big Bang model takes non-existence for granted and gets the universe out of nothing. I don't think they complain about that remark. But anyway, I said, whereas what I see as my model takes existence for granted, but not space and time. Now, if you take existence for granted, but not space and time, then you see at once that that existence can't be in time, so it can't be changing, can't be in space, so it can't be divided and can't be finite. So that existence is changeless, infinite, and undivided. But seeing it in space and time must be a mistake. Now, there's some interesting things about mistakes. You can't mistake your friend for a ghost without seeing your friend. Because your friend shows through in the ghost, OK? So that means we can't mistake the changeless for the changing without seeing the changeless in the changes. That's inertia. That's why matter is hard to shake. There's no other reason why matter is hard to shake. And the infinite has to show in the undivided, that's gravity. There's no other answer for why we have gravity. If you go to Caltech, nobody has a handle on gravity, nobody has a handle on why bicycles coast, and nobody has a handle on why their particles are electrical. Those are all the changes showing through, the infinite showing through, and the undivided showing through. Anyway, <laughs> so the interesting thing is this. The, the undivided showing through in the teeny weenies turns out to be the rest mass of the electron. And the undivided showing through in the, in the, in the dispersion of the particles through space is the rest mass of the proton. Now, if the universe was made out of something besides electrons and protons, this wouldn't be so interesting. The universe is not made out of anything else except protons and electrons. And it comes right up from that mistake, straight out of that mistake. The infinite showing through in the teeny weenies is the rest past the electron. I got that from Lawrence at the University of California in 1934. That's before your time. <laughs> and uh, the other one, I figured out for myself that the rest mass of the proton must be related to its separation in the gravitational field from all the rest of matter in the observable universe. And I asked Feynman about it, and Feynman right away agreed. And then he said, the electron is purely electrical, the proton is we're not. The electron is wound up against smallness, not wound up against anything else. But the proton is wound up against gravity, against the separation from all the rest of matter in the observable universe. Now you see, this gives us a universe of hydrogen and it falls together by gravity, you must have noticed. And the, 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 the galaxy